This is a story by an atomic bomb survivor, Mr. Hiroyasu Tagawa. That day, August 9th, and the future. In 1945, I was in sixth grade at the Shin Kozen National Primary School. I lived in the center of Nagasaki City with my sister and our parents. However, from April of that year, due to the forced evacuation, my parents had to move to the factory they operated in the Urakami area, while my sister and I decided to stay with my aunt in Narutakimachi, which was towards the mountains but only a short distance away from the center of Nagasaki City. During my summer break, I would always finish my homework early so that I could spend the rest of the time playing tag and baseball with my friends. On August 9th, during my summer vacation, I remember staying home. The Pacific War, which began on December 8, 1941, had gradually worsened, and from around 1944, the air raids began to spread all over Japan. Moreover, U.S. B-29 bombers were flying frequently over Nagasaki. The B-29 was a state-of-the-art plane, so each time I heard a roar, I would rush out to look at it out of curiosity. Then, one day, August 9, 1945, at around 11 o'clock in the morning, I thought it must be a B-29, so I rushed out to the garden. And when I looked north of my house, I saw a plane approaching from over the mountains. As soon as I said, I found it, a small white parachute fell from the plane. It wasn't a bomb. It was a radio sonde, a machine that examines various atmospheric data. Suddenly, everything turned orange. I quickly covered my eyes, nose, and ears and lay down on the ground. This was the position we practiced daily at schools for times like this. Soon, dust and debris and pieces of glass were flying everywhere. After that, silence. The second atomic bomb after Hiroshima had been dropped on the city of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. The bomber that dropped the atomic bomb took off from Tenian Island in the Mariana Islands to Fukuoka Prefecture's Kokura, which was the initial target, but headed to Nagasaki, its secondary target, because Kokura's sky was obscured by smoke and clouds. When the plane reached Nagasaki, the sky was also covered with clouds, but a break appeared at the last minute and the bomb was dropped from an altitude at about 30,000 feet, or 10,000 meters, and then exploded at about 1,640 feet, or 500 meters, above Matsuyamachi. And by the end of the year, 73,884 people had died. 74,909 were injured. 120,000 820 people's livelihoods were affected by the atomic bombing. A few hours after the explosion, thick black smoke rose and formed a cloud. The sun, which could not be seen directly, could now be clearly seen amidst the black smoke. Somewhere I heard someone scream, The sun is going to fall! After a while there were raindrops of oil and grease. When I got back home, our living room and kitchen cupboards were in a state of collapse, but luckily my aunt and older sister were safe. Although I had suffered some bruises on my head, I had no other obvious injuries. After that, I thought that my parents would be coming home from Urakami to help us, and so I waited. However, even after the next day, August 10th, came, my parents had not appeared. I began to wonder why. Was it because this area had been so severely damaged that they could not come close? Two days after the bombing, August 11th, 
After I had begun to think about why my parents could not come, I encountered a man on the street. His upper body was burned. His charred skin was peeling off and hanging down. I asked, Sir, where have you come from? From Ohashi. Furthermore, when I asked, How is Urakami town? He replied, Urakami wa naka. In Nagasaki's local dialect, naka means gone. He meant that Urakami had been obliterated. I was shocked. The entire place where my parents lived and worked had been wiped out. I feared they were never coming back. On the 12th, I set out to look for them. Unfortunately, there was no transportation available. As I walked along the streetcar route and crossed the hill, I would usually see the Nagasaki station. However, the whole station was burned down. When I reached it, I saw corpses piled one on top of another inside a burned train. Corpses were everywhere. Finally, I reached Urakami. People were looking for their family members. Using long bamboo sticks, they were turning over one corpse after the other as they floated down the river. There was an eerie silence and an overwhelming stench, the smell of dead, burnt human bodies, which blanketed the entire city. Little by little, the feeling of shock subsided. The unfortunate reality was slowly and excruciatingly hitting me. However, with a heavy chest, I kept walking desperately as I wanted to find my father and mother as soon as possible to help them. The Mitsubishi steel factory at the intersection to my left had been completely destroyed. Crossing the bridge, I finally reached my father's factory. Part of the factory was burnt down. There was no one inside. I was tired and drowsy, but I found a basket filled with cooked potatoes at a corner in the factory. Since I had been walking around endlessly with a rumbling stomach, I gobbled down the potatoes. I later realized that probably no one had cooked the potatoes. Rather, they'd been cooked by the heat of the bomb. Eating them and drinking some well water from nearby, I continued to walk around the factory to look for my parents. As I was walking past a shelter, I heard a voice calling my name. Hiro-chan! Hiro-chan! When I turned around, a woman with frizzy hair was sitting there. I couldn't recognize her at first, so I squinted and then realized that it was my mother. I felt so relieved for a moment. Mom, where's father? I asked. He is sleeping in the back, she said. I ran to the back of the shelter. There he was, my father just lying there, groaning in pain. I froze for a moment, my eyes staring vacantly at him. His feet were badly burned. When the atomic bomb fell, he was right next to some dangerous chemicals used at the factory, and they had spilled down on his feet. I thought that I could get him treated, so I went to the temporary first aid station next to the bridge I'd walked past earlier. But they were simply too busy, so I returned to my father's side. Fearing another attack from the U.S. military, I decided to escape with my parents to the neighboring town, Togitsu, where my aunt lived. About half a day after arriving in Togitsu, I heard that the Nagasaki Medical College Hospital had opened a temporary first aid station at Nameshi, located in the northern part of Nagasaki City. So I immediately carried my father there with the help of my neighbors. On the way, many women and children were walking listlessly, accompanied by two soldiers. One of the soldiers stopped and asked me, Where are you going to, kid? I'm going to have my father's injury treated. What about you? Then he said, Japan has lost the war. We are trying to escape before the Americans come to attack us. 
You should escape too, kid. But I told him, My father's life is more important, so I must go to the hospital. And so I headed for the temporary first aid station. It was the day the war ended, August 15th. The temporary first aid station in Nameshi had been set up to treat injured Nagasaki Medical College students. As soon as I arrived there, the professor in charge, Dr. Shirabe, called out, Surgery! Amputation! And my father received the necessary medical attention immediately. I sat there looking after him for the entire time. My father, who until then had just been groaning, suddenly shouted out loud, It hurts! It was the first time he expressed his raw emotions. Surprisingly, the doctors had used a carpenter's saw to cut off my dad's feet. The aid station was full of injured students, all around 20 years old. I was planning to take my father home the next day, so I decided to spend the night there. I was able to find some space on the floor between the injured medical students who were laid out on the floor. Many were severely injured, and by the time I awoke the next morning, the students who were lying on both sides of me had already passed away. After that, I took my father back to Togitsu. Sadly, my father took his last breath on the 18th, three days after his surgery. I was devastated and in shock for two days. We could not cremate my father, so we decided to bury him. Relatives whispered when they saw me not shedding any tears, even though my father had died, that I must be some kind of demon. However, I could not afford to show sadness or pain. I had seen too many unspeakable, horrifying things, so I had lost all feeling whatsoever. I felt numb. I wanted to bury my father properly, so I survived by clinging on to this sense of purpose. I returned to Narutaki to tell of my father's death. It was in the morning of August 22nd. My uncle from Togitsu came in a hurry by bicycle. Your mother is in critical condition, so come back immediately. No, not my mother too. I borrowed my uncle's bicycle and pedaled as hard as I could to Togitsu. As soon as I arrived, I rushed to my mother's bedside. Then my aunt said, Your mother almost died last night, but she wanted to see you one last time, so she gave it her best to live one more day. My mother looked at me and whispered, Hirochan, my dear child, grow up fast, okay? Along with these words, she drew her last deep breath. I could not stop the flooding tears anymore. They kept streaming down my cheeks. These were the first tears I had shed since the atomic bombing. After that, I buried my mother next to my father. He was a very strict person. He would not allow me to eat dinner if my grades went down, and I never received any words of encouragement from him. But my neighbors told me that he was actually so proud of me that he would brag about me to them. My mother, on the other hand, was such a compassionate person. When I was not allowed to eat, she would secretly bring me food. After my father died, I had so many regrets. Had I done my best for him? My dying father could only groan and not say a word. The first time he said a word of pain was... It hurts during his surgery with a carpenter's saw. And yet, despite his bravery, he still died. I wondered if I had done wrong by taking him over there. Had I not brought him to have the surgery, maybe he would have lived for a longer time. Such regrets felt like thorns in my heart. Luckily, at the age of 77, 65 years since that day, I was able to meet Ms. Miyazaki, a nurse who attended my father's surgery, thanks to a friend of mine. 
As soon as I saw her, I thanked her for operating on my father. And I finally was able to ask what had been troubling my mind all this time. Then she told me, when my father had shouted, It hurts! It was because he had been given a very painful anesthetic called a spinal anesthesia before the amputation. Also, because there were no proper surgical tools for amputations at that hospital, they had had to use a sterilized carpenter's saw. After hearing Ms. Miyazaki's thoughts, I felt my regrets gradually dissolve. Thanks to finally meeting her, at last I began to forgive myself and free my heart from all these troubling regrets. A human being unconsciously shuts out painful experiences. My whole life, I'd resisted recalling the whole atomic bomb incident and even avoided using the words atomic bomb. I had never really talked about this experience to my family or anyone. However, one day, I saw a picture of a boy who'd been killed and burned to a crisp instantly. He was probably the same age as I was at the time. I felt like he was scolding me and saying, I couldn't utter a single word before I died. You, who are still alive, can't you do something for the future of Japan? If you are grateful, why not do something useful for others? I then realized that it was not okay for me to keep silent about the atomic bomb. Perhaps due to the radiation exposure, abnormalities began to appear in many places on my body from a young age, and I had to keep going back and forth to the hospital for surgery. And at the age of 77, I developed kidney cancer, and the national government recognized this as a disease due to the atomic bomb. I do not know how many years I have left to live, but from now on, I want to do something valuable for my country as much as possible through volunteering. And so I have become a storyteller. Please, people like you who have the future in your hands, aim for a noble society and have a global vision. If we can convince even one person about the importance of peace, together we can create a peaceful society. This is my message.